All right. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us, whether you're joining us in person or you're joining us online. Thank you so much for being here. We are on part seven of a discussion that we have been working our way through in what what is referred to as the Beatitudes. Uh, we're we're going to jump right into some discussion that we that we kind of have on the front of the Beatitude that we're going to be looking at, which is blessed or blessed is the peacemaker for they shall be called the sons of God. Now, we want to get to that, and I'm going to go ahead and warn you right now, we are probably not going to finish this discussion. We cheated a little bit today. Was it today or yesterday? Yesterday. Yes, yesterday. We cheated a little bit yesterday and looked at probably a little more in depth than we should have, uh, but we come to the conclusion really quick, we should probably tell you on the front end that you'll probably have to catch the rest of this tomorrow on the uh, Practical Discipleship Live at 10 a.m., Moving forward after Easter, the Practical Discipleship Live on Thursday will happen at 7 p.m. at night. So we'll be going live on, on Thursday on Thursday nights, um, which is, is going to be a little bit different, but we think that'll be a little more conducive for people to kind of kind of catch it and get some quality, some quality um, information at night instead of looking at some of the junk. Anyway, let's jump, jump into what we have. Uh, I was reading an article. And I want to preface this. Uh, this is an article by Carrie Newoff, and Carrie Newoff is a very respected uh, leader in the church. And I, I want to go ahead and say this: I- I'm, I'm isolating some of the content of a particular article. More often than not, I believe that he brings incredible value to the body as a whole. He brings incredible insight to pastors and and leadership, and he's really good, and and I just love the value he brings. In this particular article, I want to address it because I think he bit on something or takes a perspective that we all need to pay particular attention to, and it is very subtle. The name of the article is called Six Ways to Fix the Image Problem that Christianity is Facing. So I want you to hear this. Six ways to fix or repair the image problem that Christianity is facing. And he begins to list those out. I only listed, I only have five here, actually did add the sixth one because it was a little, it was kind of off topic. But he begins by saying this in the article, the essence of Christianity isn't the same as the current angry, abusive, self-righteous expression of Christianity that's causing so many to walk away. Now, I, I don't, Right off the bat, I don't necessarily accept the premise that people are walking away from the church because of those attributes being expressed by the church or even within the church. I think people are walking away from Christ because of they are rejecting the truth of Christ. They're rejecting the truth of the word. Do those things enhance that? But the Bible tells us very, very clearly that many will fall away because they refuse to accept or acknowledge the truth. So, again, I'm not trying to nitpick this, but I really think we need to get this. The essence of Christianity isn't the same as the current angry, abusive, self-righteous expression of Christianity that is causing so many to walk away. Many local church leaders faithfully embrace the essence of Christianity but get painted with the same brush as Christians who don't. So I want to make a delineation. Uh, From the very beginning, it's always been true that the wheat and tares grow together, Mm -hmm. right? So I want to, I want to, I want to point out this, and then we're going to kick off the discussion. There are two elements that are always at work when you talk about an image, when we talk about the image that the church has. The first one is projection, and there is a high level of responsibility for us as the church as far as what we are projecting, our behavior, our attitudes, our talk, our speech. High level of responsibility because there's a... a, 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 because we have, we can do something about that. Yeah. Now, the second one is perception. Now, there's a much lower level of responsibility because of a lower level of control. I can't control how people perceive what I'm saying. I can only control how I project what I'm saying. What do I mean? I mean, some things people are not going to receive. The Bible, you said, it, you said uh, last week, you said, if the gospel is not causing a division within your congregation, you're probably not sharing the true gospel. Mm-hmm. So let's talk about it. So I agree with the projection being high priority and the perception being low priority. And with that pri- prioritization, it has also has to prioritize not just what you think about it, what you care about, but 
um, that you don't reprioritize the two amongst each other in the sense that if we worry about the perception of the church, we end up projecting something that's incorrect in the first place, right? And so I, I fully agree with the second part of, of Kerry's statement here where he says, you know, many local churches who are faithful are, are being lumped in with this other brand of Christianity. But the, I, I take exception with the first part where he's saying that, you know, the reputation of the church is, is, is to be angry, abusive, self-righteous. I think that's the church of decades ago. I think this church we see now is far too compromised because we've worried about perception versus projection. I, I think you, you may be right, Dan. Well, I, I, I truly believe that as, as the world around us, the world that we're part of, that we live in, has, has grown cold, colder toward God, we have left more room for there to be the perception that we are angry and that we are self-righteous. Uh, and what did Jesus say? They'll know you're my disciples by by what? By your love, love each other. By our love. That's our brand. Right. That's, our, that's our brand image. And sometimes I was just having this discussion uh, before we came up here with, with Eric. You know, I said, you know, sometimes we spank our children. Sometimes we correct those people around us who are not doing what they're supposed to do. That can be perceived two different ways. Right. But if we are leading people toward what is right, perhaps that comes across as angry. When you bump up against a thing that I like to do and I don't want to change, you are now angry. You are now against me. You are now violating your own brand. Now, what, what are some of the dangers? What, what would you say in your minds are the biggest danger when we stop focusing on projection, which is living a life that is consistent with the word of God, saying what is consistent with the word of God, and we begin to have a disproportionate focus on people's perception of us and what we say and how we say it. What are, what are the handicaps? What, 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 what occurs? What's the worst thing that can happen? Compromise. Compromise. Right. Yeah. So and, com and I, compromising the integrity of God's message of salvation through Jesus Christ, one pathway all, and all that comes with that. Right. Um, I think the, the proper or the, I say the proper, I think as far as I can tell, can tell so far, the, the best solution is when it comes to um, speaking to broad audiences, whether it be through preaching, whether it be on, on the internet or, or even, even just a, a decent sized crowd, you, you've got to focus on projection and you've got to, you got to almost ignore perception. But when we get down to the one-on-one, -on -one, the right. relational, like that's where it, preaching turns into teaching and like help, let me help you cross the bridge you're having trouble with right now. Okay, I can do that person to person, but you can't do that in a crowd of 100 people. Right, because right? that's a context of communication that you're working on. Exactly. And you have an opportunity to shape that per perception and through communication change what, why people are assuming or coming to certain conclusions. Yeah. Very important. Well, you know, the, the, the phrase that, that you read a moment ago, the essence of Christianity, the essence of Christianity is staying true to the word of God, staying true to what Jesus taught. And if you read any of the New Testament, most of the letters Paul wrote, he was addressing things. So this is not new. This is not new that, that we have this perception of, of what it should be like and what things we can bring in and how we can dilute the gospel. That's not anything new at all, not to this age, not to any age between, between us and the first century. Right. So, you know, we, we need to worry more about bringing the truth, about staying true to what God's word says. Um, and sometimes that looks angry. And I think we have a model for that. The early Christian church, when dealing in the context of the Roman society, Christians were considered atheists. Yeah. They were marginalized and hated because they didn't accept all of the gods. Mm -hmm. You know, they just, they just marginalized it down to one God. They didn't participate in, in, the, in uh, temple prostitution of, of whatever way that went. And, and they were like, well, what's wrong with these people? They don't support what everybody is doing. They're anti-society. Well, that kind of was true then, and it's kind of true now. Uh, you know, so... Kerry laid out about six, six things here and six areas where we, the church, needed to clean up their perception or their image. And again, I think I wanted to say what we said as far as our responsibility and the, and the ability and, and responsibility of people hearing, because you're going to hear through whatever worldview you have. It doesn't mean we don't say it. John the Baptist came and he spoke so eloquently when he said, you brood of vipers, repent, stop it. He, was, he might not have been kind, but he was clear. And that's what the culture needed at that point. So he said in the first area, number one is politics. And he says this, many leaders 
use their pulpit not just to speak into politics or justice issues, but to, but to speak in support of partisan talking points. The moment you wade into partisan politics or political conversation that takes a very narrow point of view is the moment that you alienate at least 50% of the people that you're trying to reach. It's, um, it's, one, it's one of the things churches do that isn't in the Bible and it isn't helping long-term outreach. Now, now I struggle with this. I want to hear you talk back on this because so many moral issues that is the church's business have been politicized. And if we withhold our voice from that forum, what do you, we're, 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 we're not being the salt and we're being the light. Yet if we speak into that forum, we're, we're alienating, alienating people. He said, it's one thing for churches to, that it's one thing that churches do that isn't in the Bible. John the Baptist, let me go back to John. Why was he beheaded? He was beheaded because he spoke moral truth to political power and it cost him his head. Mm -hmm. Um, so this is one of those areas, and we're actually going to have a, a local pastor come on um, soon, and we're going to have a discussion on, on one of our live Thursdays concerning, you know, what are we supposed to do when it comes to politics? Because these issues are real, and just because a particular party aligns with a particular moral issue that aligns with the Bible, if that, if that pushes people away, is that our responsibility? Well, you said politics, and you also use the word politicized, and that's really important for us to understand. If we are speaking to moral issues that have been politicized, then we're not necessarily entering into, the, into partisan politics just because we align with one party or another as we are bringing the truth on, on a moral value. That doesn't make us, um, that doesn't put us in the political arena. That says we're speaking to a moral issue. Well, it, it didn't, but functionally, I have had pastor after pastor and church after church say, we don't want to get involved in the pro-life movement. And I've got leaders who can testify of this. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm just telling you this is a reality because of the pressure, the partisan political pressure that they feel not to address an issue like that that's so heated. So all of a sudden, we are abstaining from a, a biblically moral perspective and sharing that because of fear of political repercussions. What are we, what are we supposed to do? Well, Jesus said, blessed are you when you're hated for my name. So if we are speaking the truth and, and, and we're hated as a result, we're in a good place. But people are going to perceive that as partisan politics, not as how much of that is our responsibility. Only how we message it, right? So we can, we can get better. We can refine our messaging. That's the projection right. piece, right? And again, the one-on-one -on -one we, can, we can address. I have, no, I have no reason to spend my time entertaining somebody's objections when I don't think they're a good faith actor. Right. right. When I think they just want to shut me down or my argument or, or my, my worldview that is biblical and I know that and I can trust that, not just because somebody else fed it to me, I, I don't need to have a discussion with that person. Right. Anyone who thinks they've got the moral high ground and wants to discuss our different points of view, all for entertaining that conversation. Um, and I, I think we need to be willing to do that. We need to be courageous enough to do that. The, the reason you've encountered um, pastors or other church leaders in, in other uh, locations that, that don't want to get into that is because they've surrendered to my flock has an identity that is greater than their identity in Christ. They've chosen their identity in the rights they think they're owed or the practices they want to they want to continue to practice or their political identity. Or, or D, or E, whatever it is, they've, they've, they've decided, that person has decided, this identity is more of a priority for me, and that pastor knows it. And he says, if, if I address this thing, that person is going to choose one identity over another. He's going to leave. But they've already chosen, so why not speak truth? Well, you were correct when you said we can't control the perception that people have of what we have to say. And, you know, I, again, I'll say when we bump up against that thing that people want to continue to do, um, and it's perceived as hate because now I'm against you. Now you're against me and what you're saying and what you're preaching and what you're teaching from the word. Um, it, it, because there comes a point where I can be some, I can become so eloquent. I can become so diplomatic. Um, I can exercise such diplomacy in my addressing of issues that people miss the urgency yeah. of the issue. Uh, when I can't say thou shalt not kill and people who are killing their children are killing 
It's an egregious offense against God, and it is wicked behavior without fear of ramifications and the perception of people who, who first of all, aren't going to take God's view on anything anyway. I've put myself and the church and the culture and the local community into a very, very dangerous place. Now, I, I want to pause that because we're going to come back and we're going to have that discussion with that pastor. And we're going to be talking about this. Um, it is a political season and I hate to talk about it, um, but we've got to know why. We've got, to, we've got to say and recognize and share our obligation not to back off of issues that are moral, biblically addressed issues because of a political atmosphere. Right. It shouldn't matter. But we, so we should search within ourselves, right? So uh, I think the three of us, we have, we have the same viewpoint on the thing that's been cited already, abortion, right? Right. The, so how do, we, how do we deliver that message better? That, that in a conversation with somebody, you would let somebody know, look, because they will know us by our for how we love each other, right? That, right. That's our message. That's, that's, our, that's the essence. So look, I love that baby so much to stand up for it. I love that woman so much to know that because I have women in my family who've done it and who've regretted it and who've right. paid the emotional baggage price their entire life since, right? So I love that woman so much to help her see what she's doing and stop. And, I, and, I, and I, as a father, I understand what that father's going to feel. Right. And so I love all three of those people, not to mention the people that are on staff at a facility that are going to help them kill that baby right. and what they're going to pay for. Right. You know, so it's not so an either or. Exactly, exactly. I'm conveying, yeah. the, you, not just convey the love. This is not just pro-life. Let's save the babies and the heck with it. We're here for everybody. But, there, but the perception has become so overwhelming. And I want to put this issue that, that we are, it's, a, it's an affront to women's rights. I'm not concerned about people's reproductive rights or whatever terminology it looks like. We are concerned about the atrocity, the offense against Almighty God, and the repercussions that it has in a real world when we kill off a generation. Mm -hmm. You know, that, that yeah. is kind of one of those things. How do, we, how do we navigate that and other issues? Please join us next time on Thursday. <laughs> anyway, so let, let me jump down to this next one. Now, this one, this one put, this was interesting. He said, scandal is the second problem with image in the church. He said, the church should be a very safe place, free from abuse and corruption and misuse of power. The fact that it is not is troubling on about a thousand levels. Let me just say this. That is true. I agree with that statement. But, but to say that that is a church image problem, I'm going to say this, and some, some, people, some people are going to freak out over this. That's a Jesus problem. But what I mean is he chose to leave the wheat and the tares and allow them to grow, the get, grow together. I want to remind people that every single book that the Apostle Paul wrote almost in the New Testament was addressing scandal and abuse and sin within the context of the church. Why? Because there are wolves and there are sheep. There is wheat and there is tares. That is a perception. And when people are looking for a good excuse, Bad experiences make good excuses. You hear this all the time. I, I'm, I'm fiercely pro-church. I'm not saying, you know, this is why it's important for us to live lives that are holy. Mm -hmm. Paul said, or Peter said, when you suffer, let it be because you're, you're doing something good and they just return and they just are convicted and they hate good. Don't let it be because you're doing dumb stuff that the world is doing. Mm -hmm. It's very clear. But when the church invites everybody to come and be a, be a part of experiencing God at least so they can come to know God, you're inevitably going to have people who slip in. All through history, we've seen that. How do we clean up an image when, when it is kind of ordained that we open our doors and we open our hearts and we give people chances? So, uh, w one, carrying out good church practice, right? So it starts, it starts in the beginning, when you, whatever church you're planning, right? you got to pick your leaders wisely. And there's, there's, there's guidance, there's clear guidance for who qualifies and who doesn't. And then that you're supposed to even take, even if somebody appears to qualify, you take time, and right? Them, you, right. You, don't, you don't lay hands on anybody quickly, Absolutely. right? And, and, and we, there's good reason for that, right? Because time is enough of a factor for many people and their ability to uh, disguise their behavior or their real intent. Wolves are the most patient right? people Ex sometimes. <laughs> exactly, right? So, so there's, good, there's good church um, leadership development in, in there. There's also transparency that needs to occur, right? So I think a lot of the reason the church rightfully so has a, a, a black eye is because instead of handling things appropriately and in, in the right forum, 
the capital C church in many instances, many denominations covers it up. Okay. okay. I agree. And so, and so we can't cover it up. We, there, there's a difference between covering sin and covering up sin. Right. Right. And then lastly, you know, church discipline. So when, when somebody's bad behavior is revealed, addressing it appropriately, okay. offering a path to restoration, a healthy, wise, appropriate one, given the situation, but modeling from top to, to bottom, from start to finish, all those, all those facets. And that's the double-edged sword that I want to talk about for mm-hmm. just a minute. If a church, very few churches exercise biblical church discipline, would you agree? I would agree. Tell me why. Weakness. It, it, being afraid to being afraid to encounter objection from someone up close. Perception of us dealing. Now we we have thrown that terminology about. We're gonna we're gonna do a whole show. We're gonna do a whole episode. A whole teaching. Whatever you want to call it. On church hurt. But very often, let's be honest. Churches don't deal with it biblically. They don't bring people up because they don't want to embarrass them. They don't want to in- expose them. They don't want to eradicate the sin. And it says a little leaven will leaven the whole lump. That's why you deal with sin in an organization. But the perception and the perception, because in our culture, what happens? People that you call out on sin and you say, listen, I can't allow you to keep working in children's church when you're sleeping around with somebody over here. We address that. That person gets mad, goes out and paints this perception of a horrible, intolerant, holier than thou righteous church because we're trying to honor the word of God and protect our children. That's the double edged sword. How 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 do we navigate that? I hope you are feeling the, you know, well, the, the I, tension. I would say this, you know, because you, you brought up one of my favorite phrases, which is church hurt. You know, um, it, people leave for the, the dumbest reasons. People look for reasons often to be offended. I mean, this is certainly the culture we understand, you know, waiting to be offended in, in the current culture that we live in. But when we leave problems standing, when we don't address them, and I've seen them be addressed, at least within this church body, I have seen problems be addressed before they become big problems. But when people walk away because they have been addressed in their sin or because the thing that they're doing has been addressed directly, um, I don't know that we're responsible for them being church hurt. I don't know that we're responsible for them picking up their toys and going home. We're, we're responsible for delivering the truth. We're responsible to address with biblical standards, things so, that are being done wrong. So does it take a strong leader to say the heck with the perception of this thing? We need to do it God's way. We need to address these issues and we need to put God's standard and his commands and his directions uh, above their feelings and ours. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Right. Well, I just, just wanted to clarify. I thought it was rhetorical. Just to say that very, very succinctly. <laughs> I, yeah. was, I was waiting for the catch. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, and, and, and I wonder sometimes what state is a person in when you call them out on inappropriate, ungodly behavior and the response is not humility. There may be an essence issue to begin with. Uh, there's mm. a, at least a humility issue. Let's, let's, let's jump to the next one because I think it'll tie in and we're running out of time. Now, we're going to do this and then we'll come back and, and we'll come to the weirdness and hate on, on, on the next one. But humility is self-righteousness. The church has a perception of self-righteousness that is not beautiful. He says, humility is a much more effective evangelism strategy than self-righteousness. I would absolutely agree. Mm-hmm. I would absolutely agree. Uh, Self-righteousness is like pride. It only looks good to the self-righteous. Everyone else is revolted by it. Uh, I would agree. I think that that pride and self-righteousness, but let's, let's, let's ask a question. If I were to ask people in this room right now, if I were to ask the people online who are believers, how many of you believe that your righteousness is based upon you and your goodness and what you do and you hold that as leverage over others? I would say very, very few uh, would, would, would agree and say that that's true. So when we talk about the church and the church having a posture of self-righteousness, I want to I play the, the angel's advocate here for just a minute and say, let me ask you, isn't the self-righteous label attached to anybody who has the audacity to live a holier life than you? What do you think, Eric? <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's used for, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, so I even, you know, dealt with this. 
um, I just went home and visited family and I was at, at dinner with my, my father and, and my sister. And I don't even remember what came up, but I think, I think we were just trying to pray before dinner. And uh, my sister was like, oh, you got to be all pious now, oh, don't yeah, you? holier you than know? thou. You know, and... I'm like, you don't even speak King, like, King James. <laughs> <I'm talking. laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the it, it's an easy thing to throw out because if I can say you're just... If I can project that Dan's just being holier than thou, then no, I, I've i immediately erased the standard that I should maybe raise my, the, my quality of life and the way I behave, right? right. I've said... This dude's trying too hard, man. I'm going to live under grace. You know, God's got me. God knows my heart, blah, blah, blah. And everything will be, everything is going to work out, you know? So uh, it, it immediately, in, in putting that label on somebody else, it, it relieves us of a responsibility. Right. But I think it's at best, I mean, we're talking somewhere around 50-50, you know, people who are actually self-righteous versus people who are being labeled self-righteous. Right, right. You know, so so the the two Christian slams or the two slams against the church are off, often you are legalistic, mm-hmm. or you are holier than thou, or you are self righteous. Where that applies, fine, but the the perception of phony self righteous is always going to be in the eye of the beholder, and the world is always going to take that position against something that it innately or inherently hates. Um, you know, Jesus, he summed this up. He said, here's the verdict. Light has come, but you love the darkness more, so you have rejected the light. Whenever we become the salt, I believe that whenever we become the salt and light that God's called us to be, people are going to be repulsed by that. And when we set a standard in our lives that is not subject to to the, the moral decay in our culture or the shifting sands of priorities and values in our culture, all of a sudden people are going to look, and if it brings condemnation to their current behavior, they're going to attack that thing. So I I want us to be slow to say, okay, yeah, I know there should be no self-righteousness, but let me ask you something. What are you supposed to do? Pretend to live less holy lives to appease somebody's perception so they don't accuse you of being self-righteous? Do you see this is, I mean, all of these are paradigms that are no-win situations for the church. I don't think the answer, I think the answer to all of these to this point have been Authentic living and holiness before God, in humility, walking and living transparently before God, and let the chips fall where they may. Yeah, I mean, ultimately recognize that, hey, we're only capable of doing any of this because he showed us how, and then he lent us his spirit so we could overcome all of our flaws and weaknesses, right? Our Our love for sin dies through our love for him, right? It is God who both wills and to do of his good pleasure. He gives us that through his spirit. You know, when I, I, can, I can look at a number of different places and, and see uh, how we are perhaps perceived as a church, but I, I can't label an entire group of people. I can't see a dude pocketing some change at Dairy Queen at the window and, and say, everybody who works at Dairy Queen is bad. Dairy I King's can, going I, to hell. I can't look at a, a CEO of a company and say, because he's doing right or wrong, that everybody in the company is, is doing right or wrong because that CEO. And certainly we shouldn't label a church that way either. There are people who are doing wrong in church. There are people who who are for nefarious or just uh, prideful or just self-righteous issues are doing things that are incorrect. And we and, don't skirt that, we deal with that. Right, and but, that, that's what we're supposed to do. But, but you know, I can, find, I can find hypocritical actions in just about anywhere that I look, and certainly we can see them in the church as well. So it's not, it's not that everyone is bad, it's not that everyone is good, it, it is the perception of the person who is looking on. And the thing that makes it even more complex, right, is so, while well, you said people, there are people within the, organi- within the organism that are doing good, and doing bad. There are people that are doing good for good reason, and there are people that are doing good for, for um, self-aggrandizement, right? Getting yeah. themselves noticed, right? Mm-hmm. There are people who are doing bad because they like bad, and there are people doing bad because they don't realize it, and they think they're doing something good and helpful and fruitful for other people. Mm-hmm. So um, there's not just the, the action, right? But there's the, the source of the action that, that needs to be taken into account in all of those situations. Right. And, and the fact that there is and always has been a double standard. When your favorite football team has an athlete on that team and he loses his mind and he ends up getting thrown in jail, you don't dump the team. 
Well, it depends how they're doing that season. Well, but. Yeah. <laughs> you know, your favorite race car driver, right. you know, when he okay. rams that guy, you know, into the wall and you know he was wrong, you know, <sighs> but you don't quit NASCAR. But, very, but like I've said, bad experiences often make good excuses for that to validate, let's just be honest, the slant of the heart that is against God to begin with. We need the transforming power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I love what, what Woody said. We're going to be having Easter and we're going to be sharing the gospel. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the power of God unto salvation. That is a transforming mm-hmm. power that not just changes, um, that it frees us from the power that other people perceive us or, or of, of being that. So let, let's jump into this last, this last part. I really want to hit blessed are the peacemaker because I absolutely believe that it goes along with exactly what we're talking about. He didn't say blessed is the peacekeeper. He said, blessed is the peacemaker. I think he understood that righteousness and peace and joy are elements of the kingdom. And here on the earth, we live in a chaotic, broken mess. And Here's what I find interesting. He said, they shall be called the sons of God. And if I'm not mistaken, that word for sons there is the word that means mature sons of God. So when we actively bring peace to chaos through the power of the word, through, through boldness, through a lack of compromise, then I believe that is setting us up to fulfill that particular beatitude. What thank you. Well, I look at some of the situations um, just in current headlines, recent headlines. You know, we, we saw what happened in, uh, in that uh, Russian uh, concert venue on, on Monday, and, and quickly people were going along with, with the, the desired narrative that Ukraine did it. Uh, you know, yes. we're, we're, we're quick to, Nero to in the church. Point, point out blame. And then, you know, within minutes, well, within hours, because I wasn't there within minutes, but within hours, you know, with the uh, situation with the, the bridge in Baltimore, we, we were already talking about whether or whether it was not terrorism. You know, we, we were ready to be the victim. We were ready to have somebody to blame. This is where we come in. This is where peacemakers come in. We are breaking that chaotic atmosphere up, and we are supposed to be, as Christians, as peacemakers, bringing reason to the table. That's what a peacemaker is. Right. So not just, um, I, mean, I just want to clarify, you're saying not just within ourselves, but bringing it to the community, the company, Absolutely. the church. Like, right, sharing that perspective, that discipline, that, that slow to judge, slow to speak, quick to listen, that kind of mentality. Like, Back to our brand. How do they know us? Yeah, By our life. Right? So, <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And I think it's easy for us to, to, to do it ourselves, right? But to find the way to introduce that into what is a hostile or growing hostile situation, whether it be with, you know, Two, two co-workers getting into it and you just happen to walk into it like, well, this is awkward, you know, and you can dip out or you can, you know, kind of help, help them reason through that and be like, look, man, I, I, I know you and I know you and y'all, y'all don't mean what, what, each, what each other's accusing y- y- yourselves of, you know, so we can, we can be the diffuser and, and the uniter versus mm-hmm. the one who's um, just, I don't want to be a part of it. Yeah. You know, like yeah. just just stepping back. We could step in, step in confidently as long as we understand how, how would Jesus handle that situation? How would Paul handle that situation and and address it well? What, what if we what if we did just a slight paradigm shift? And I remember getting a hold of this years ago and it really was transformative to me. An ambassador for another country, when he comes, he walks in that country's authority and where he makes his residence literally becomes uh, the, 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 that plot of land that is governed by that government, not the government that's, that it's in. Anybody who has seen um, any of the Mel Gibson movies knows about diplomatic <laughs> immunity. Um, you know, so, I, so there's, this, there's this aspect of diplomatic immunity where, where we, we impose or we bring the values and the virtues of a different kingdom into this kingdom. I look at it as, as if we're salt and we're light, we are supposed to affect the chaos by bringing or establishing peace. So when he says you are a peacemaker, when, when we experience those things, and don't get me wrong, I know sometimes we have this proclivity to do it in, in the same way that the world would do it, which is rush and sickle them in the name of Jesus, you know, and, and pin them on the floor until they, you know, submit. Um, but, but I think that the principles of the kingdom applied to this world 
wisely, habitually, uh, and effectively are, are what transforms chaos to peace no matter where we find it, whether it's in our houses and that fight is between us and our spouses or between our children. When we release those elements and those virtues of the kingdom and the, through, the, through the, the application of principles, I'll give you an example. You, you talked about coming in between two co-workers who are at each other's throats. We know that the word of God says and is true that a gentle word turns away or quells wrath. How many times have you walked up and, and you didn't have to quote a Bible verse, you didn't have to do whatever, you just simply understood that principle and began to speak gently into that situation? Guess what you're doing? You're making, you're inducing elements of the kingdom into the, into the broken chaos of this world. And I, I don't know that sometimes we don't really see it that way, yeah. but whether it's between coworkers or, or it's enmity and strife being quelled between you and a boss by utilizing biblical principles, it's just that. Well, this goes right back to Carrie's statement that the church should be a safe place, right? And that, that's not the building. Like, you're the church. I'm the church. Anybody hearing these words that believes Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior died for their sins, you're the church, which means anywhere you step into, you bring that light, which means you bring that safety. So, you know? so can we do that effectively if our lives aren't filled with peace? Now, let, let, let's talk about this for just a moment. We're going to be moving into a series later on in, in, in the month or in, in next month talking about the Holy Ghost and talking about what the fruits of the Spirit are, love, joy, and peace. I think the problem is very often, if we're honest, we've said this before, you can't give something that, that you don't have. Um, you know, so I think it's important for us to recognize what we're full of. Are we, as you know, as talked about in the book of Revelation and other places, are we drunk on the wine of this world? Are we, are we filled up with the, with the works of the flesh and the cares of this world to the point that we're not full of the Holy Spirit and all those things that are residual results of that? Dan. Rhetorical question. <laughs> we're almost out of time. Yeah. Uh, in fact, we're, we're, we're going to have people screaming at it in just a minute. Dan, final thought. You said some really important words um, in that last little section there. You said the words ambassador and you said kingdom. We've got to remember who we are. We've got to remember who we represent, not just who we're called, but who we are. You know, when we enter a situation, whether it be a couple of coworkers, like you mentioned, or whether it be sitting with a group of people who are arguing over something that's happening in the news or in politics, we have got to remember that we are representing the king. Mm. We need to re remember that what we say mm. speaks for the kingdom it, and it speaks for the one who sent us and that's Jesus Christ. And we can only act as he acted and be right. Eric? Well, I mean... Jesus kind of tells us, right? So we got to kind of do what he says, that we should be the peacemakers, right? We, right. The, we'll be blessed for it. Uh, but I, I think it's essential. I, but again, differentiating peacemaker from, from peacekeeper and going back to the original topic of this discussion, the, the uh, projection versus perception. Like right. we can only be accountable for so much. But we need to own it. We need to own it. And we, if we're good stewards, we're good stewards of of every dollar we spend, every word we speak, the tone we speak, it like everything we do, not just one thing, right? So uh, we've been given a mouth and, and, and we use it quite frequently. And so what, when, we, when we share the message, however it is, we, we want to season it the best we can. And whatever we were saying when we were 20 should be far more refined when we're 40. And, <laughs> and it should be shiny, gold-plated, you know, like platinum by the time we're 60. Like, there's, if you've been walking with the Lord for decades, then even, even your speech should reflect it in, in all situations with all people. Oh, amen. Amen. Um, Dan, you said something, and that, that is that, that maturation process that should be working in every single person. I have not yet obtained, but this one thing I do, I press on to the mark of the high call of God in Christ Jesus. I press to conform to the expectations that God has, has placed upon me and made available to me through the blood of Jesus Christ. But you said something. You said it has a lot to do with our identity. And I'm going to submit to you, I'm going to submit this to you. You will never fully know, understand, or embrace your identity, or to the degree that you know God is to the degree that you will know and embrace your true identity. 
when we're trying to be like someone and embrace an identity given to us by someone and we don't really know him, it becomes an impossibility. I want to encourage you to know Jesus, to love him, to return to that first love if you found yourself waxing cold or, or moving away. I want to encourage you to, to visit daily with the master, to sup, to invite him in to fellowship and to spend time getting to know not just the word, but the God from whom the word has flown freely. Um, thank you, everybody, for being here. God bless you. If you need prayer, there'll be people here to pray with you. We look forward to seeing you next time, and uh, that'll be tomorrow. God bless you.